We're gonna get into the nitty gritty of digestion. The title of this uh, presentation, Fire in the Belly, is really, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a catchy name, but it's just to, to, to get you thinking about how this process of chewing something and swallowing it and how that affects your health, uh, to get you thinking about that from a different perspective. So we're gonna start kind of big picture what's going on in our healthcare system and then we're gonna get a little more detailed as we go into the, the steps that you'll need to take to fix your digestive system. And, and you can walk away, if you, if you listen to what we're talking about tonight, you will be able to walk away and implement steps that will improve your digestion and therefore your health and your well-being, okay? And, and those of uh, your family and those around you. So one thing that motivates me is you know, I grew up hearing that we were the richest country in the world and we're this great and that great and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I love my country, but we're really not that great in terms of health. So, you know, I kind of want to do my part and, and make a difference there. So you can look at life expectancy. In 1950, we were fifth in the world. Now we're 50th. Okay? We spend more than everybody else. We get less in return. It bothers me. Okay? We have a diabetes problem. And everything I'm talking about tonight will have a component that relates to digestion. Everybody, everybody with a diabetes problem has a digestive system imbalance. It's going to go hand in hand. I mean, pretty much any disease that they've looked at, autism, cancer, autoimmune diseases, they, depends on where you look, right? But if you look at the gut, you will see evidence that the gut needs to be uh, improved and can be treated, and that can help their condition. But diabetes is a big problem. So about half of uh, you know, females in this country, 40% will have type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. That's just not okay. It doesn't, it's, it's not, doesn't have to be that way. And this is like the first time this has ever happened to us as a group of people. We're getting worse at giving birth to healthy babies. Um, I'm a parent, I have young children, uh, young child I should say, and you know, infertility is a topic that comes up in our, in our sphere with our friends and it's a big problem. Not only is infertility a growing problem, but giving birth to a healthy baby, having a healthy mom, having a healthy baby is getting more and more difficult. So digestion is just the first place to start with any health condition. So if there's one thing you take away tonight, the one thing you should do, no matter what your health problem is, whether it's a behavior problem, mental health, I already talked about cancer, autoimmune disease, work on your digestive system and you will improve. You can take that to the bank. And you know, there you have it. Lifetime, based on the latest, latest data, you know, if you're a man, you have a 50% chance of having cancer in America. If you're a female, you have one in, you have a 40% chance. So these are not good statistics. This is the world we live in. It has an enormous, uh, has an enormous amount uh, to do with our digestion. So our digestive system problems are causing these statistics to, some, to, to a large part. Just looking at the numbers, we're spending twice as much as the next country in line, and those are the statistics that we get in return. So if we're continuing to spend money and do something to try and fix a problem, and the problems continue to get worse, I think we could all agree that we're not treating the source of the problem. Maybe that would be something that we could all agree on. If, if, you, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and the problems get worse, then we need to take a different look at what we're doing. So again, this is just showing on the average household in the United States, you can see that in 1930, we spent about 25% of our income on food. Food was more expensive in 1930. Food was much healthier. All the food in America was organic. All the animals were organic. All the eggs were organic. All the milk, okay. Cheap food came along. But look what cheap food did to our health care costs. The red line has now replaced the green line. So we now spend much more on health care than we do on food. And I would argue that it's better to go, go the other way, right? Spend more money on food, take uh, a, a vacation closer to home, but buy organic food, and in the long run, you're going to be way better off. Because this is what's in our food supply. This is what feeding or genetically modified corn does to lab rats. Okay, I'm not, a, I'm not a rat doctor, but I can tell you that's probably not okay. Right? There's something wrong with those animals because they were fed a food that's actually a poison. And the problem with GMO is that GMO has been altered 
at a genetic level. So there's things in the DNA of the plant that never existed before. And when we get it in our, into our body, they use viruses to take like something from a salmon and to inject that characteristic into a tomato. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, that is what scientists are doing. Taking a gene from a salmon and trying to put it into to a tomato so that the tomato can withstand cold weather just like a salmon can withstand cold water. All right? it, I mean, that's maybe an interesting idea, but it's probably not a good thing to, it's, pro it's probably not gonna work out, right? So that's not how Mother Nature intended it. This is a study that was done, it was a journalism, it was kind of a journalism expose on different, different families around the world. They looked at you know, 30 different countries all over, the, all over the world and they just said, hey, pile up what you eat in a week, smile and we'll take a picture and we'll write a little article about it. So I'm picking on this family, but this family is no different than millions of families across the country. That's the kind of food that comes back into the house when they go out and buy groceries. Now, probably 90% of everything you see on that screen would not rot and not go bad if it was left out for six months. So I'm gonna suggest that doesn't qualify as food anymore, right? If it doesn't rot, it's not alive, doesn't have any living quality. So if this is what we're eating, it's no wonder that we're so sick. So it all starts with your digestion, it starts with what you put in your mouth. But that's just where it starts, it doesn't end there, okay? I love this slide because uh, I'm a big I'm a big data nerd. But basically, this this kind of shows us what our current diet uh, experiment is doing to our brain in general. What what's happening to the health of our brain as a group of people in this country? And what you need to know about this slide is, in you're looking at the all causes of mortality per the CDC, all causes of mortal, mortality the last 60 years. Okay, and you can see I have a stop smoking campaign at the top. What that means is they, you know, doctors used to recommend camels, and then other doctors would recommend Marlboros. But they, they kind of got over that, and they decided that maybe, you know, smoking cigarettes wasn't healthy, and so they started a campaign to get people to stop smoking because they noticed the connection to lung cancer. And so you can see that disease, heart disease, and stroke went down when that campaign started. But you see this red line in the bottom that came out of nowhere. Well, that red line is Alzheimer's disease. Now, the argument is, well, they didn't know how to diagnose Alzheimer's. Well, yes, they did. It just didn't exist. They had nothing to diagnose. So starting around 1980, Alzheimer's and dementia came out of nowhere and is now the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So something is happening to our mind as we age, and it has so much to do with what we eat and a lot to do with what's going on in our digestive system. So, what I want you to think about is that carbohydrate eating is the reason why that line is going up. Low cholesterol in your diet, low cholesterol in your body is what's causing and triggering the d destruction of your brain. Because your brain is about 25% cholesterol by weight. All right, so, or I should, I should rephrase, 25% of all your cholesterol is in your brain. That's, that's the right way to look at it. But, you know, Eat your Cheerios, eat your whole grains, eat your whole wheat bread, take your drugs that lower cholesterol, and keep your cholesterol as low as you can, and you'll live forever. You'll lose your mind, right? You'll have a high risk of having Alzheimer's. Fats are the most important part of our diet for your brain. So egg yolks, uh, fish oils, free-range beef, all this stuff. I have, I have multiple patients who can't lose weight, we, get, we convince them to try to eat high-fat, low-carb diet, and they lose weight just without even exercising. So you have to eat fat to burn fat. We are fat in this country because we eat carbohydrates. And that also disrupts the bugs in your gut. So we have bacteria in our gut that, need, that, that live in harmony with us, okay? We have 100 trillion cells that make us who we are, but we have 10 times as many cells of bacteria living in us. And as morbid as this sounds, when we pass away and we go back to dirt, the bacteria that breaks us down is already living inside of us right now, okay? We wouldn't be able to survive without bacteria in our gut. We would have no, our immune system would not work and we wouldn't be able to get vitamins from our food. So the good bacteria, and we'll talk a lot about this, eat toxins and poop vitamins. 
Okay, one of the doctors that I've learned a lot from, his name is Dr. Robert Rakowski. Uh, he's a very, very smart uh, clinician, okay? Chiropractor and kinesiologist. And he's, he, he has a great quote. He said, bad bugs eat vitamins and poop toxins, good bugs eat toxins and poop vitamins. You have, you have bacteria in your gut that will poop out vitamin B9. They eat, so, so keeping those bacteria in the right amounts keeps your body full of the right vitamins. Or having bad bacteria means you become deficient. But as you're, if you want to know about brain health, the bigger your waist gets, the smaller your brain gets. There's a direct correlation. They've proven it without a doubt. The bigger the waist, the, the shrinkage in the brain, especially the part of your brain that deals with memory. And it has to do with the endocrine system. So in order to have a big belly, you have to have a problem with your hormones and your blood sugar and all these other factors have to be happening in order for the belly to grow. And those same things that cause the belly to grow cause the brain to atrophy. But you can reverse it. You can keep your brain, you can, you can make new connections, but this is just kind of, hey, look, we have an obesity problem, we have a brain problem, we have a digestive problem, okay? So I love this picture, all these statistics, all this data that just says, oh my gosh, it's so terrible out there. I mean, yeah, we're fighting an uphill battle to be healthy today, but it's a battle worth fighting, and the rewards are much greater than any you know, issues you have getting started. Um, I often find in my practice that the quote that comes to mind most is, you know, when the pain of doing nothing becomes greater than the pain of changing, you will change. And that's kind of the people who we get in our office. They're just like, all right, I'm just, I'm fed up. Three years of trying everything under the sun, I just need someone to help me. So if we tell, if we tell them to do something that's a little inconvenient and a little uncomfortable, they're willing to do it because staying the same just doesn't work anymore. So we have this, we have this digestive system. Uh, you're gonna learn all about it tonight. But your digestive system talks to your brain, okay? Your brain kind of sits behind a firewall. It's isolated inside bone. It's isolated with a, a gate, a fence, to keep certain things out and certain things in. But your gut talks to your brain and kind of tells your brain about the world you live in. And another thing to think about your gut is it's actually not part of your body, in, in, a, in, a, in a way. When you eat something, so I was eating cashews on my way here, raw cashews from natural grocers, that, they're good. Um, putting them in my mouth and swallowing them does not mean that they are now part of my body. You guys, we have to understand that. That means it's moving down a tube that's 26 feet long, and if things work correctly, it will become part of my body. But just swallowing it does not make it part of you. That is all controlled by the digestive process. And so if you think about it in terms of when we were growing inside of our parent, inside of our mom, the same cells that became your skin are very much related to the cells that became your lungs and your gut. It just got folded inside, okay? It's a, it's a great design. So, you know, from your mouth to the other end, in terms of, you know, the structure of the cells are very, very similar, almost identical to the cells that make your skin, okay? So your gut is a tube, and what's in the tube is not part of you. Fascinating idea, right? So, your health really does depend on digestion. And I've, I'm gonna say it over and over again tonight, if there's one thing you can do for yourself, is imp it's improve your digestive system, okay? If someone's been on antibiotics and they've had problems with yeast and they have an imbalance in their gut, you cannot go to the store and start doing smoothies or, or juicing and taking vitamins because you're throwing fertilizer onto weeds. And if you have too many dandelions and too many thistle in your yard, you just dump fertilizer everywhere and say, oh, I'm taking good supplements, and you don't get any better, or you get bloated, or you have symptoms, you're seeing the side effect of throwing fertilizer on weeds, okay? So this is why getting your gut right sets the stage for doing other things that makes you even better. So it's an old idea, I'm, you know, I'm certainly not the only person talking about this, and even back in the, you know, ancient Greece, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. And you can turn that around and say, if food is medicine, then food can also be poison, right? If one is true, then the other is, is uh, inferred, right? So we have to be very careful about what we choose to put inside our bodies. <coughs> what, we are what we eat, we've all heard that. I'm gonna change it, and, you're gonna, and it's, 
We are what we absorb. Okay? I have patients who go to the bathroom and they see what they ate for dinner in the toilet. Well, they didn't get any vitamins or minerals or protein or any benefit from that food. It went in the tube and out the other end. That's called malabsorption. Um, one of the doctors who was kind of a, a pioneer in the 1960s and 70s in uh, chiropractic and kinesiology, his name was George Goodhart, and he said that, you know, in America we're not malnourished in the traditional sense like in parts of the third world where there's not enough calories. We, we're, we malabsorb. That's one of our biggest problems, I would totally agree. We're not malnourished, but we malabsorb. So in my quest to find out more about the gut, the first thing I wanted to figure out is how big is it? Because some people say it's 26 feet long. I've heard it's as big as a tennis court. Somebody said two tennis courts. Well, that's a lot of surface area. It's a lot of surface area. 2014 Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology, pretty recent science. It's about as 350 square feet, which is not a small area by any means. 350 square feet is how big your, it is from the stomach to the other end or basically the small intestine to the other end. If you unwrapped it, pushed it out, totally spread it out, it's 350 square feet. So next time you take a probiotic that's that big, think about opening the capsule and spreading it out over 350 square feet. Just, it's a lot of surface area, okay? So this is some new, some new slides from last time we did this presentation. Um, we've been doing some research on how stress affects digestion, okay? Really, really, Fascinating information. So if you took, for example, a Petri dish where they grow bacteria, okay? And you took E. coli. Everybody here has E. coli in your gut. It's totally normal. Everybody here has salmonella. Totally normal. Everybody here has candida. Totally normal. The reason people have a problem with candida is if you take antibiotics and you kill all the bacteria, there's no longer any competition for resources. So the fungus is left sitting there going, okay, I got all the sunlight, all the nutrition, and I can spread my wings and grow out. And that's exactly what happens to yeast. So this is the, one of the negative side effects of antibiotic therapy is you will create more yeast and candida growth in your gut. But you have these two Petri dishes, you take a piece of E. coli, a little sample, a little guy, two of them, and you put one in one Petri dish and one in the other, okay? Then you squirt adrenaline into one Petri dish and leave the other Petri dish alone, and you come back in one day. And the Petri dish that got adrenaline will grow 10,000 times faster. So if we get stressed out and we have crisis in our personal life, we have food allergies, we have bosses who are abusive, we have relationships who are abusive, we are overtraining and exercising too much, we're not sleeping. There's lots of reasons to raise adrenaline. If you have all this adrenaline, half of the adrenaline you release goes into that tube that I was talking about. So every time we get stressed out and our pulse racing, we're driving to work and some jerk tries to cut us off and we just start, heart starts pounding, half of your adrenaline went straight into your gut. The other half went into your bloodstream. You're gonna have a bacterial growth from the stress because the bugs that live inside us are listening to us. They're looking for chemical messages to see if we are stressed out. And if we tell them we are stressed out, they go, okay, grow, grow. But if we tell them, we give them different signals and the bacteria will sit still and do its job, which is to help keep it strong. So again, other study, this is looking at basically the stress gut connection. When we're stressed out, the red stuff you don't want, it's doubling or tripling in size when animals are put through a stressful situation. So this is how our guts get imbalanced. I really believe, aside from antibiotic issues, most people's guts are dysfunctional because of psychological stress. There's a direct connection between how your brain perceives the world around you, your level of stress, and how your gut functions. A very, very close relationship. And you can't go into someone's life and wave a magic wand and change everything that's stressing them out, but you can help process these issues better. You can, you can give them more, uh, more tools to be more successful and the stress affects them less. And then they start to have less symptoms with their digestive system. And again, this was based, this is salmonella. So the black lines um, are the growth of salmonella versus the white, which is no adrenaline. So they're both, both bars represent salmonella. The black bar is when you add adrenaline to it. 
And we can all see that that bar is much bigger than the white. So stress causes bacteria to grow. Bacteria will make it, can make us anemic. So having a lot of uh, stress and having this imbalance of bacteria in your gut can steal your iron. It's just an example of how the bacteria can steal nutrition from you. Uh, biofilms, it's like a bacterial city. It's like bacteria architecture. They, you, know, you have a little bacteria and then they build this like scaffolding that they live in and that can coat your gut. And not to be too gross, you're gonna go home and just have like, you know, nightmares about this biofilm stuff, but if you have a lot of imbalance in your gut, biofilms can pose a problem because they, they, they create a barrier between your gut wall and the food that's coming in. So you, your food cannot get to the gut wall and that's where you absorb your food. So there's one of the problems with malabsorption right there. That can be fixed. You can take supplements like NAC, sulfur supplements, will cut biofilm, it'll break it up. And then you get, you know, there's just things you can do to, to make it go away. So um, again, if you nourish the gut, you will have a very positive effect on the brain. Every single person who has any neurological symptoms, personality, sleep, um, I've already mentioned stress, post-traumatic stress, I mean, all these disorders are associated with excess stress hormones and gut imbalances. And here's what this study says, it's from 2012. It says, if you get the right probiotics in your gut, it regulates your anxiety, your mood, your, your cl clarity of thinking, and your sense of pain. So I talked to a lot of people who are in pain, can't think, have tons of anxiety, and are really moody. Well, there's a gut problem talking to you, okay? You can fix that. Probiotics do lower anxiety. They can increase learning. They, probiotics, when you have the right amount in your gut, and we'll talk about how you do that, it actually allows your brain to make a chemical where it makes new connections with other neurons. So you, it, it keeps your brain plastic, growing, changing, adapting, learning new things. So I talked about Alzheimer's and dementia. That's the opposite problem, right? There's nothing, there's no, no new connections happening. They're withering away. Look at this data from 2013. You get your gut right, you get the right bacteria in there, create a good environment, and your brain starts to change. Gut-brain connection. Very, very cool stuff. Okay, we're putting out the fire. We're gonna talk about the seven steps. Seven steps to healthy digestion. By far and away, the most important supplement that I use in my office is HCL, stomach acid, okay? I've probably gone through more bottles of that than anything else in my entire catalog as long as I've been in practice. And the reason why is that your stomach is so important for everything else that happens below it that if the stomach is off then the next step the next domino will not fall correctly and then on and on and on um, the number one cause or the number one complaint that probably everyone in this room has felt before is stomach acid reflux anybody not ever had acid reflux before so we've all experienced that burning you can kind of taste your food it doesn't taste very good uh, it, can, it can be really painful. I've had patients waking up in the middle of the night thinking they're having heart attacks. So the number one cause of heartburn is too little stomach acid. And that's a paradox. It bothered me when I heard that. But further study and further, you know, further awareness, it's absolutely true. The reason your stomach doesn't... I'll sh we'll show you why your stomach needs stomach acid, and that's probably the first place to start with anybody who has a digestive problem, is make sure they're making enough stomach acid. So how big of a market is treating heartburn? 6.3 billion in one year for one drug, the purple pill. Now you can get it over the counter. You see the commercials everywhere. I feel bad for people taking that. And there might be a medical reason once in a while small percentage of that that it makes sense to put someone on a proton pump inhibitor but if you block stomach acid you create osteoporosis b12 deficiency which can lead to dementia and neuropathy you increase the risk of diarrhea you increase the risk of pneumonia and you increase the risk of hip fracture which is if anyone has aging parents or people they've cared for elderly once you break your hip your life changes forever right your life changes for it's a very serious injury um, all because they shut off stomach acid and without stomach acid you can't absorb calcium so we, we try to help people avoid that there are other alternatives 
So I mentioned before the stomach needs acid. What you need to pay attention to here is that at the top of the stomach you can see this thing pinched closed, okay? It's like a valve. You have a valve at the bottom called the pyloric valve or sphincter and you have the one at the top, lower esophageal valve or sphincter. Now the key to this, the key to the whole stomach is this. Um, the sphincter right here that prevents heartburn shuts really, really tight when there's acid in your stomach. When there's not acid in your stomach, it's open, okay? And your stomach is a tumbler. It's not just a limp bag. It's full of muscle. It's, got, it's covered in muscle. So when you eat, your stomach should shut the top and shut the bottom and go like this. Mix everything together, okay? That mixing action will splash your contents of your food and your acid onto your esophagus and it will not feel very good and that's what, that will allow you to taste what you just ate 30 or 40 minutes after or an hour after, okay? That's all because that, that valve is not shutting. Now there's a small fraction of people who don't tolerate stomach acid that's because they have some kind of gastritis or ulcer present and that's not the right thing for them at that time. But far and away most people most of the time do not make enough stomach acid that's why they have heartburn. Again, if you get the stomach more acidic, that sphincter shuts and the cause of heartburn goes away. So I talked a little bit about stress and how stress changes your bacteria. Stress does lots of other fun things for us. Um, one, of, one of which is it moves blood around in your body. Who here has heard of fight or flight before? So everybody, everybody's heard of fight or, fight or flight. So good, so the awareness of this is pretty, pretty good in, the, in, um, in this room. And what fight or flight is, it tells you if you listen to what it says, it's fighting or running. And if you're running away or fighting for your life, you will have blood in your muscles and blood going to your heart to make sure that you can run as fast as possible or fight as best as you can to stay alive. You will not have blood in your stomach. You will not have blood in your colon. You will not have blood in your pancreas. You will not have blood in your liver. You don't have blood in your small intestine. You, you can't have blood in everywhere at the same time, right? So your body shifts gears and pushes the blood out of your core into your muscles so you can run away or fight and stay alive. And that's great. I mean, that has saved our ancestors from multiple problems in the past. And it's good that we have that system. But if you take oxygen away from your stomach and your digestive system, you're gonna have a chance to have an ulcer you're going to not digest your food because without oxygen, the cells in your gut can't function. So your digestion slows down. That's why you eat food and you're like, ah, I'm not breaking that down. That's sitting in there like a ton of bricks, you know, and you feel full after just eating a little bit. You feel full for hours after you eat. Especially here, here's, here's what you'll notice. If you skip meals and go like six or seven hours without eating, this idea like your stomach shrinks is just baloney, okay? Stomach doesn't shrink. What happens is, is it's stressful to skip meals and your body releases a ton of stress hormones to raise your blood sugar when you've gone six or seven hours without eating. And the next time you sit down to eat food, you don't have any blood in your gut. So you try to eat food, but you get full like halfway through your dinner and you're like, ah, I shouldn't have skipped meals, you know, because the more you eat, the better your appetite gets. Skipping meals is really, really not good for us. So that's where ulcers come from, stress. This is how stress causes ulcers. It pushes the blood out of the stomach and then the stomach gets injured, okay? They gave healthy people without heartburn acid blockers like the purple pill. They didn't have any heartburn before. They said, here, take this pill. Eight weeks later, they took them off. Every single person in that study got heartburn after that. So the drug that fixes it causes it. I mean, how does that work? Well, it's because you're messing with the body's normal function and you're trying to like suppress normal function. Well, anybody who's raised children knows that if you suppress activity, you just get more of it, right? You have to do, come at it a different way. Talked about the hip fractures, diarrhea, pneumonia, B12 deficiency. Don't mess with stomach acid. It's like essential for your health. It's the one thing, if there's one thing someone can afford to do, please make sure your stomach gets acidic. So if digestion is your most important part of your health and the first place to start, the first place to start in your digestive system is making sure you have enough stomach acid. Most of, if you do that, then other, you're, you're way ahead of that curve. So osteoporosis is a problem and if you don't absorb calcium, 
you will not be able to prevent osteoporosis over the long term because your body will be forced to pull calcium out of your bones that you absorbed 20 years ago to make up for the fact that you can't absorb any now. Right? You, the calcium has to come from somewhere. So your body's going to make a choice. It's going to say, I'm, I'm going to make your bones more brittle to keep you alive rather than let your pH and your blood get out of balance or some other bigger problem happen. So your body's always trading a less bigger problem. It's, it's always going for the lesser of two evils. It's very good at doing that. Right? It, it would rather go for a slow, chronic problem than an acute one that might you know, be, too, be more serious. So hypochlorhydria, low stomach acid, is a risk factor for osteoporosis. So anybody with osteoporosis, you, friends, family, coworkers, anybody you know, talk to them about taking stomach acid. It'll help them prevent bone loss. A little quick video here. All right, good afternoon. I'm here with uh, Roy, who has been going through some heartburn over the last uh, few years. And Roy, how, how long had you suffered with heartburn? Um, I, at least 20 years, yeah, maybe 25, I can't remember exactly. Okay. A long time. And how fast was this protocol able to turn around your heartburn issue? One week. Unbelievable, yeah. So uh, typical uh, would be to wake up in the middle of the night with, like I was explaining to you, heart attack kind of symptoms where you're in a really severe chest pain radiating down into the arm and up into the throat and it really made me nervous and, you know, but it's intense enough to wake me up out of a sound sleep. And then um, I started taking, I forgot what this stuff is called, Medi Medigest. Medigest. Um, so I, I worked my way up from one tablet after every meal up to, I'm at six after every meal now. Um, I sometimes get slight, like burning sensation in the more in the throat, not so much in the chest, or not, not in the chest. And I sleep through the night. I don't get heart. I don't get heartburn. That wakes me up. And so, so what percentage would you say your heartburn has been fixed after one week? Ninety-nine percent. Wow. Easy. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, do I have your permission to share this with students, patients, and doctors everywhere? Yeah. Any, absolutely. Any conditions? No. Awesome. Uh, no. Thank you. Use this stuff a lot. <laughs> so, a patient of mine, um, you know, recently came through our office, and again, he was waking up in the middle of the night thinking he's having a heart attack, because if you're starting to burn the esophagus, the nerves that receive pain from the esophagus are sitting really, really close to where your heart sits, and so as far as your brain is concerned, it's almost coming from the same area. So you get some of this. He was getting some of the same symptoms, and that's. Uh, that's a common problem with heartburn. Sometimes people have pain of the pericardium covering the heart because of the inflammation in the esophagus. But what, happened, what we do is we have them in, you increase your dose over time to figure out what you need. And he was, what he was saying is he started, to get a little, he started to get too much acid because he was taking too many of these tablets each time he was eating. He was taking six. So he ended up taking like three or four and it was, and it was perfect. So he had it for 20 years and it was gone in a week. We gave him stomach acid and his heartburn went away. It's really, you know, it, it works. If that's the problem, this stuff works. So gallbladder function. I love the gallbladder. It's a, it, it gets a bad rap, and it gets cut out a lot. But you weren't born with any extra parts. People who are parents or have been tended to birth are well aware that usually we just see a baby come out, and there's no spare, spare parts that come after, right? So we, we have everything for a reason. And your gallbladder is really important. Your gallbladder allows you to digest fats. It creates a soap. And when you're doing your dishes without soap, you realize it doesn't work because soap cuts fat into small pieces, allows it to run off your dishes. Well, your gallbladder does the same thing. It releases bile that breaks up your fish oil tablet into tiny little pieces so you can absorb it. This is the only way you're going to absorb fat, is to have bile in your gut. And when you cut out a gallbladder, you change the body's digestive process from that point forward. It, it, it can be restored, but that person has to take bile support with their meals ongoing, especially if they're eating fatty foods. But fatty foods are good for you, so hopefully they are, right? So vitamins like A, D, E, and K, and calcium. Bile is necessary to help absorb calcium, so now you have the osteoporosis connection again. 
So no gallbladder, harder to absorb calcium, more likely to be deficient. It's one of the most common, it's one of the top 10 most common surgeries in the country. Now there's lots of different reasons why it gets cut out. The main, the, ma the most common person has a gallbladder taken out is female, fertile, she has kids, she's flatulent, she's fat, she's 40. So she's had more exposure to more estrogen over time. Estrogen goes into the gallbladder and estrogen makes, so normally your, let's say your bile should look like, um, like a liquid. It's a very liquid substance. It should squirt out and go downstream and get out of it. Like soap coming out of your dish soap. Okay, so let's say dish soap and, and bile have the same thickness. But if you have a lot of estrogen going through your body, you're not processing it right, your bile turns into molasses. I don't know about you, but if you turn a jar over on molasses, it takes a long time for it to come out. So if that's what happens inside of your gallbladder, that gallbladder is going to get sick. And over time, these stones will form and crystallize and then by the time you have an attack, it may have to come out because you have a stone in your gallbladder that big. There's nothing right now they can do to fix that. So that's why women are more susceptible. It has to do with estrogen. It can be totally prevented as well with nutrition. It's a nutritional problem. Moving, removing estrogen from your body is a nutritional problem. It can be fixed. The right vitamins, B vitamins, ingredients from soy and flax, other things like that help you remove estrogen. So burping. You know anybody who just burps uncontrollably? Hiccups and burps? You're looking at somebody who's not digesting fat very well at all. Okay? They need support for their fat digestion and their burps will likely go away. So we're going to talk about pancreas. It's the next, you know, uh, suspect on our talk tonight. Number three. So your pancreas releases enzymes that allow your body to chop your food up. So you chew it and it breaks it down, it goes in the stomach and it goes like this, but the stomach really breaks down protein, that's kind of what it starts. But the stomach doesn't do a lot of breaking your food down very small, that happens in your small intestine. So if you see food in the toilet after you eat it, and I'm not talking about corn, haha, -ha, everybody does that, we just can't digest corn. If you see other food like lettuce or spinach or tomatoes or other foods that you're eating, it means that your pancreas is probably not releasing enough of its enzymes to break that food up. So you're not getting the full nutritional value of what you're eating. That's typically the problem. Other problems are is that the transit time is going too fast. So your food goes into your intestine and it's moving by the pancreas too fast. It's not sitting, it's like a conveyor belt. If it, if it starts going too fast, the pancreas doesn't have enough time to break it up. Okay? But again, all of the pancreas function, all of the gallbladder depends on acid in your stomach because starting with digestion is the best place to start with any chronic disease and starting with stomach acid is the best place to start with any digestive problem. It makes the pancreas work much better. Yeah, if you see, if you see food in the stool, you have a pancreatic problem until proven otherwise. If you have a real fatty stool that floats, I hate to be graphic like that, that's a gallbladder issue. You're, too much fat is going in your mouth and going out the other end. You're not absorbing your fat. Alzheimer's, dementia, nervous system, skin health. You see someone with dry cracked skin, they, their fingers crack when it gets cold, their heels crack so much that they bleed. You're looking at someone who has a fat, omega-3 fat deficiency. Their gallbladder has a problem. It's not doing a very good job of helping them absorb fat and they're not getting enough in their diet. You know, um, we all know about diabetes, type 1, type 2. Type 1 is autoimmune. The body doesn't make enough insulin. Type 1 diabetics typically get really skinny, have sudden weight loss for no reason. Type 2 diabetics have the opposite problem. They, they just keep making more and more insulin, and eventually their pancreas gives out. But they, they just keep dumping insulin on top of insulin, and that causes usually a type 2 diabetic's overweight because insulin is the only hormone. Insulin is the only hormone we make that allows us to gain weight. Every other hormone we have breaks us down, releases something from our cells. But insulin is the only one that makes us gain weight. And you can prove it by just looking at a type 1 diabetic. Without insulin, you just shrink. You will, you will lose weight and lose your life without insulin. This is fascinating stuff. So we have multiple hormones that tear us down and one hormone that builds us up. You want to have a good balance between all of those. So, the pancreas is super important. We've got to take care of our pancreas. 
I recommend eating frequently, every couple hours. Two to three hours you should be snacking on something. The only time you should fast is between dinner and break fast. That's why it's called that. I was a terrible eater as a kid. I ate Pop-Tarts, Eggo Waffles were my favorite. I love Fruit Loops, I love Fruity Pebbles. I like to, you know, eat hot dogs as much as I could because they're yummy. But I also had a serious blood sugar problem and high school was very difficult when you don't eat and you just are having adrenaline and your blood sugar is going up and down. You have reactive hypoglycemia. It changes your personality actually. So kids, without, kids with behavior problems, they have blood sugar problems. People with, I mean, mood changes, getting shaky, getting dizzy, lightheaded. I talk to patients all the time. They're like, I take a shower in the morning and I start to pass out and I have to sit down. Well, their, their, their blood sugar is so low when they wake up that, you know, they start moving around and their, their brain's not getting any fuel. Blood sugar is so important. So the way to take care of your pancreas, eat low glycemic. We'll talk about that. But eat frequently. Eat frequently. You will lose weight if you eat frequently and you're eating the right foods. It's, it works like a charm. Food allergens. Before the discussion started today, we, we, I was discussing with uh, Cammie about, um, you know, are you, are you dairy free? She asked me if I was dairy free as well as gluten free. Now, I find that dairy doesn't make me feel the best. It's just something I've figured out after avoiding it for a while and putting it back in. Now, I love, I wish I could go and eat gluten free pizza and have lots of Parmesan cheese because it's delicious, but you have to listen to what your body's saying. It's kind of what she said, right? Listen to your body. What one man's food is another man's poison, okay? This is a true story. Gluten is a major problem. It's GMO, it's hybridized, it's been altered, and it's in everything. So if you have a little allergen, if you have a small allergy to something and you come into contact with it once in a while, that's okay. So let's, put, let's use alcohol as an example. Alcohol, we all know, is a poison no matter who you are, what part of the world you're from. Can we all agree? Alcohol is a poison. If you come into contact with alcohol once in a while, you kind of do okay, right? You do, it's okay. People who drink a little bit live longer than people who drink none. People who drink a little bit live longer than people who drink none. And people who drink a lot, well, they, they, they pass away before everybody. So there's an example. If you're putting a poison in your body all the time, it's much more damaging than coming into contact with once in a while. Gluten is in everything. Soy sauce at your favorite sushi haunt is 60% by weight gluten, okay? It's like they're cutting their product, okay? They're making more money, but they're cutting their product. They're taking a little bit of soy and a lot of gluten and trying to, you know, trick you into thinking it's just soy sauce. Well, they're making a ton of money doing it, but they're also poisoning it. So you can get real 100% non-gluten soy sauce, which is the way it's always been in Japan. It tastes amazing and won't give you any of those uh, gluten-related symptoms. So gluten is a major one. Dairy is a major food allergen. Soy can also be an allergen, but there's so much misconception about soy, we should probably do a night talk just on soy. That would be a good one to do. Um, you read one time that soy is good for this, and you read another time that it's terrible, it has these estrogens in it. What you need to know is that people in the world who eat the most soy have the lowest rates of prostate, lowest rates of breast cancer. That's a fact. Even in America, we have the worst soy in the world because it's all GMO'd and sprayed with Roundup. People who eat soy, they've done studies with soy and it's helped individuals in our, individuals in our country with breast cancer too. We'll get in, we can get into that some other time, but basically soy, but soy can be an irritant to the gut. So can tree nuts, almonds, pecans, walnuts, cashews, and so can deadly nightshades. Anybody know what the deadly nightshades are? Peppers, tomatoes, anything else? Eggplant, okay, that's right. Bell peppers, chilies, salsa. Can you imagine living without salsa? That would be hard. I can give up gluten, I can give up dairy, I can give up soy, but oh, that would be hard. But I would be willing to do it if it made the difference, right? So, you know, these are some examples. That's kind of it. There's some, I know, I know, I know two people I've met in my life who are allergic to fish. Don't ask me how that works. I don't know why. They're allergic to fish. 
I don't know the mechanism, okay? Um, some people say they're allergic to spinach or blueberries or apricots. I mean, probably, probably not. There's probably something else going on that's causing their gut to be imbalanced, and when they eat these foods, they get symptoms, right? But huge, huge deal. Food allergies are a major, major player in all of our lives, and they make a lot of uh, digestive problems worse. Talked a lot about gluten. So think back again to this gut surface that's 350 square feet, okay? 350 square feet of tissue, but it's only one cell layer thick. One cell layer thick. So if you could theoretically pick up this 350 square foot carpet that's your gut and hold it up to light, most light would pass right through it, okay? It's like a screen. It's like, it'd be like, you know, uh, translucent. That's our gut, okay? It's very, very, very thin. And the reason why it is, is that it allows you to absorb things across it, right? So that's why we can't rub chicken or, you know, you know, sweet potato on our arm and get full. It just doesn't work that way. We have 30 layers of skin that will block that, right? But your gut's different, so it's one layer thick. That's why it's easy to poke holes in that, that fabric too. It's easy for that fabric to get ripped and torn and have holes in it. And when you have holes in the gut, anything can leak across. And so your body wastes all its energy trying to clean up and stop the you know, farm animals from running into the house and destroying all your furniture, right? Tracking all that mud in. Point being, if that's happening every day, you're gonna spend all your time trying to clean that mess up rather than having energy to work out or feeling like sleeping or going dancing with your partner for a, a nice date. I mean, you know, chronic health problems really change your quality of life and not having energy, it's all energy in the end, guys, right? Is life nothing more than just energy? And the only reason I'm here talking to you is because I have the energy to, to do it and I like it. It gives me energy and you have the energy to sit and try to process this and it's like drinking from the fire hydrant because this is like a thousand hours worth of work coming at you in one hour. So, you know, I don't expect it all to stick, right? I've been in that chair and I continually learn in that chair too. So we're all students, but that is leaky gut. That's my artistic version of it, okay? You eat something that bothers your gut, it pokes holes in the screen, then you have inflammation, you have achy joints, you get a runny nose, you get a sinus infection, you get a migraine, you can't sleep, you get heart palpitations, you get dizzy. I mean, the list is very long, very, very long of what comes from gut problems. This is why it's, it's why you fix the gut, you, so many things get better. One more uh, recent video here. Okay, we're here with uh, our patient, Lindsay, and she just finished a intense week detox with me. And Lindsay, would you just mind sharing with us what was going on with you when you first came to see me? Sure. Um, when I first came in to see you, I did not feel good internally. I was bloated all the time. My runs were basically miserable. <laughs> um, I didn't feel well at all. My guts always hurt. Um, so, yeah, I just did not feel well. <laughs> and was the program that we put you through, how, was it difficult? Um, it's, yeah, I would say it's not easy, but you have to go in mind frame knowing that it was going to help you. And it definitely completely changed how I felt just in one week. One week I came in today and... I feel a hundred times better. I'm not bloated anymore. My runs are more comfortable. Um, I feel I have more energy. I don't have to get up and get that cup of coffee anymore just to get going. Um, I'm able to just grab the shakes that you recommended and go out the door and my day starts off well. I feel more focused and um, more just I guess happy too, <laughs> in a way. So. Great, great. And so, would you'd recommend what we put you through to other athletes Absolutely. and other patients that are doing? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Good so, luck on your runs. Thanks. <laughs> so another example of how a digestive pro problem shows up in someone's life, right? She's like a Lindsay is a very good, uh, ex excellent athlete. She was. Um, like all American track and field in college, but she's like, she's a distance runner and she just had like crippling gut pain when she ran, okay? 
So the thing she loves that makes the rest of her life balance, she can no longer do because it hurts. Do you think that's going to cause unnecessary stress in her body? Not way beyond just the gut? Absolutely will. And so the biggest question from a doctor's point of view is when someone comes into to an office is why are they there? And everybody's reason for coming in is a little bit different. And that's the main question you have to answer. Why, she was in because she could no longer do the things she loved to do. And that was run. And so running is a stress. Running a long distance is even a bigger stress. And so you get that gut loses oxygen even longer. And then you can have that gut pain and that dysfunction in the intestines from all the stress of running. But, you know, we were able to help her with a program that addressed those issues, and that was her one week later. So she was, she's great. Um, it's all about the gut. You can make the gut change in about seven days. Every three days, that whole membrane, that transparent sheet that's 350 square feet, right, that gut wall is totally died off and replaced. And when we go to the bathroom, most of what's in the toilet is our dead cells by far. So that part of your body is growing faster and turning over more than anything else. It's always regenerating, boom, 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 all the time. So if you're insulting it every day, it just tries to regenerate and it gets hurt again, over and over again. So it's just standing still and then slowly you start to slide backwards because you're wasting, you're blowing br a bridge up and then rebuilding it over and over again. So when you stop blowing the bridge up, then you have all this extra energy to do other things. Clean house, remodel the kitchen, go on vacation, you know, whatever. So step five, talked about blood sugar. I mean, I cannot under, I cannot over, over uh, estimate or make, I can't make this point bigger than, than, than it is. Balancing your blood sugar is probably the most important thing you can do with your daily routine. I mean, it is just that big of a deal. It has to do with diabetes and balancing your insulin levels. It will help you weight, lose weight. It will give you more energy. You should be able to wake up in the morning and go all day long without having to crash and take a nap. How many people here have to feel like they crash between the hours of 2 in the afternoon and 6 in the evening? Okay. It will get better when the source of that energy problem is addressed. But having skipping meals can cause that. A lot of people get a post-lunch, uh, you know, nap time, and what they've done is they've eaten breakfast, probably not the right food, maybe had a high sugar snack around 10, or even skipped meals till 12 or noon, and then you eat food and it puts you to sleep. So if you eat something and you get sleepy right afterwards, you either a ate too much or B, you ate food you're allergic to, or C, both things happen. Food should not make you fall asleep. There's no more tryptophan in turkey than there is in steak, or, or you know, uh, wild game, okay? It's just during Thanksgiving, we overeat. We eat so much, we put ourselves to sleep, and go, oh, it must be the tryptophan in the turkey. Well, no, it's because you, you've dumped so much food in your body, it's trying to process all that. So, Balancing your blood sugar involves eating frequently throughout the day. You just have to do it. It's a discipline. There'll be a million reasons not to. It's an inconvenience. It's an expense. You have to plan. You have to think about it. Well, if you don't think about what you're going to eat, you're going to drive down the road and Carl's Jr. will think about what you're going to eat instead. And it's not going to help you. Right? I mean, that's how the fast food industry works. They just catch you at a moment of weakness. You're too busy. You're hungry. I'll just swing in, turn the car in there, get your food, it's like instant gratification. No, but it's, it's not good for us, right? We all know that. So balancing your blood sugar, I would recommend you treat leaving your house like going hiking. You bring water, you bring food, and you do it every time you step out the door. Just get used to that. And then when you go hiking, you'll never forget those things. But you know, when you go about your daily routine, you'll make sure that you have food that will at least, something you can grab that's convenient, nuts, if you, you know, or um, you know, snacks that that work. Vegetables that you've cooked earlier with coconut oil. So you get the vegetable and you get the fat. That's a really good snack. Um, cook a lot of vegetables in the morning all at once. Get a cold pan, heat it up, put coconut oil or olive oil in there. Let that oil heat up. Then throw your spices in. Let that sit in there for about a minute. So the spice and the oil kind of mix together. Then throw your vegetables in and cook it on low heat for 20 minutes or so. 
kind of breaks down the cell wall, the broccoli or the um, green beans, and just kind of toss it. And then if it cools off, you, you could even put it in the fridge at work, it still tastes great because it's covered in fat and your body craves the taste of fat. You can put some sea salt on there and you get fat and salts. Like, I love potato chips too. I'm not the only one who eat. I mean, I, that's my advice. So, fat and salt. Those are unsalted, but that's okay. You're depriving yourself. No salt? Come on. No, I'm kidding. So, small frequent meals will make you happy like her. You'll have more energy. You will get your body weight and your body metabolism to a better, healthier place. They did a study, um, reading the book Grain Brain. Anybody heard of that before? Fantastic book. Grain Brain. Grain Brain. Great book, okay? They did a study about weight loss. And they gave people different diets. They gave people a high carbohydrate, low fat diet, high carb, low fat. They hardly lost anything. They gave people a low glycemic diet that still included like instead of 60% carb, it was like 40% carb, 40% protein, and 20% fat. It was still low glycemic. They lost a little bit, a little bit more than the group that was high carb. But the group that blew everybody away was the high fat, low carb group. They ate 60% of their calories from fat, 10% of their calories from carbohydrates, and 30% of their calories from protein. You eat fat, you burn fat. But the quality of the fat matters. Egg yolks from organic chickens. I mean, if your cholesterol is under 150, we're going to talk about this next month, September 30th. We're doing a cholesterol talk. It's called uh, the cholesterol connection. What's it really all about, right? Low cholesterol is a big problem, and it's a serious health problem having low cholesterol for for many people. Okay. What, so, what in our in our office, low is under 165. We're picky. Ha Okay, so I have patients who come in and their last blood test showed them at 89 and the doctor's patting them on the back saying, you know, good job, you're going to live a long time. And they're, it's, it's bad, it's, it's the wrong advice. And I'm not saying that doctors prescribing cholesterol medication aren't trying to help their patients. I'm just saying we're just going to look at the science and let the science tell us what, what's real and what's not. So low glycemic is necessary, but I would often encourage you to take everything on that Everything in that picture, dice it up and throw it in a pan with coconut oil, ghee, organic butter, or olive oil. Cook it that way and eat it with fat, and you'll eat more of it because it tastes good, so you'll eat more vegetables, and you'll get your fat, and you'll be more satisfied, and it'll balance your blood sugar. I mean, there's all kinds of supplements that are made, like, like butyrate and these other supplements that people produce that you can just get by eating butter. Just eat organic butter. But if you're going to eat one thing organic in your kitchen, it absolutely has to be our butter. Because butter's the, non-organic butter is the biggest like, reservoir of <coughs> toxins in our food supply, probably. Because the cow eats corn grown with toxins. It goes into the cow's fat tissue, and then the milk is all the, there's all the milk fat in the milk, and they con butter's just concentrated milk fat. So you, you're concentrating all the toxins down the line. So non-organic butter, stay away from organic butter. Organic ghee, you know, clarified butter, it's all good stuff. I'm grossing you guys out, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, but food is, I'm a foodie. You can't tell it by looking at me, but I, obviously, food's a big topic in all of our lives, and uh, food's real important. Okay, who here exercises past seven in the evening? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pick on anybody, but I'm gonna say that exercising past seven will make the body less you will benefit less from working out past seven because you release, if you're working out correctly, you're trying hard and you release adrenaline. And adrenaline and stress hormones take a certain amount of time to get out of your system. Who here has gotten in an argument at eight in the morning and felt bad at five in the afternoon? Okay? Or had someone cut you off, you know you're having a bad day, someone cuts you off on your way to work and you just totally freak out and lose it inside your car and you're yelling at them. And then it's like, you shouldn't have done that, and now you're dealing with like all these, you just don't feel good. Well, the stress hormones you release, adrenaline and cortisol, they mess with your chemistry in your brain. And you actually get a little drunk from stress hormones. So people who are having like real adrenaline junkie experiences, like jumping out of airplanes with parachutes attached or
climbing big, scary, icy, cold mountains or, you know, American Ninja Warrior, I guess. There's lots of different adrenaline junkie ways out there, uh, ju junkie outlets. Adrenaline will kind of make you feel drunk. It turns into a type of alcohol in your brain. That's why being stressed out <coughs> at 8 in the morning can still make you feel off at 11. The adrenaline's been, the stressor's gone, but the effect is just lasting and lasting and lasting. So if you work out late at night, you create a, extra adrenaline, it makes it hard to sleep, and it just, it's best to try and work out earlier. If you're working out hard, it's even more important. I mean, going for a walk or riding your bike around the neighborhood is one thing, but if you're really trying to get fit and push yourself, it's much better to work out earlier. That gives your body a time to wind down, because what's going to happen is you're going to try to go to sleep around 11, your sleep's going to be okay, you're going to wake up, be extra sore, more inflamed. So you can actually make yourself more stressed out by exercising incorrectly. Exercise the right way and you feel great. They say 30 minutes a day for everybody. Every time I look at it, it goes up. Maybe it's 45 minutes, maybe it's an hour. We sit too much. I'm the lucky one tonight because I get to walk around. I get to walk around in my office. I don't have to sit, you know, I don't have a desk job. Um, it's really hard on people who are. I have a lot of patients. A lot of us have to sit at a desk to feed our families. And sitting down is the new smoking. So we should probably come up with a better alternative, right? It's bad on, hard on the spine, hard on the structure, hard on the metabolism. This position right here, where the gentleman has his feet in the chair, is an excellent way to calm down. Because what he's doing is he's taking the biggest muscles in his body, his lower legs, his thighs, those are the biggest muscles in your body, and he's pour, pouring all the blood from his legs back into his stomach. Like I talked about earlier, stress moves it out of your stomach. Sitting in this position for about 10 minutes, closing your eyes, listening to calming music or no music at all, and just unwinding will put blood back in your gut. And when, if you get up and go eat dinner, you will digest it better. It's something, it yeah, doesn't cost anything, just 10 minutes, a little preparation. I like yoga, it's good. Um, prayer, meditation, things that calm you down are important. I find that in our lives, when things get busy, and families are involved, if you're a parent, if you have to be a caretaker of someone who needs your help, the first thing that falls off your list is exercise. Why is that? We think exercise is like a, a maybe, I'll get around to it type thing. You know, if you don't, you know, if you don't find time to exercise, you'll be, pretty soon we'll be sick enough, you know, we can't hardly do anything. So we have to move our bodies. Doesn't mean you have to join the gym and have a personal trainer. Just means you have to do something fun that you like doing. Get a stationary bike from Plating and Sports. Get an elliptical and just do something. Get a trampoline. Trampolines are really hard. Try to jump on a trampoline for like five minutes. You'll be sore. And you'll, be, and you'll, have, done your, you'll have done your thing. You'll have worked out. So I'm throwing a lot at everyone tonight. Um, just a few things I want to talk about to help your digestive system. Because remember, the digestive system is the first place to start with any problem that someone's dealing with long term. And the first place to start with the digestive system is stomach acid. Then you have to look at the gallbladder. You have to make sure the pancreas is working. If someone's burping, if they're having, if they can't tolerate fats, they have a gallbladder issue. If they're going to the bathroom and you see food in the stool, they have a pancreas issue. If they're having reactions, in inflammation to food they're eating, they have a food allergy issue. Everybody in America has a food allergy issue until proven otherwise. Okay? Everybody, especially my generation, and then the younger generation, it's off the charts. Pretty soon you're not going to be able to bring anything into, into a school except purified water, and uh, they'll probably still allow gluten. They would never, ever have a sign, don't bring gluten into a school, but don't bring in your peanuts or your strawberries or your eggs. Have you guys seen the signs at elementary schools? They will not let you on campus. They will not let you in the building if you have strawberries or peanuts anywhere in your backpack or in a box or anything. That wasn't the way it was when I was a child, and certainly it's gotten worse. So, there's, so clean protein is organic meat, wild game, and deep, cold water fish. That's clean protein. Healthy fats, fish oils from a reputable source, grass-fed beef, <coughs> cold water fish, um, you know, flaxseed oil 
in moderation is okay, but it's not going to make a big difference. It's not going to help you make omega-3s. We don't convert flaxseed oil into omega-3 very eff efficiently. If anything, if we're lucky, about 10% turns into that. So we have to eat omega-3s. We depend on that. More so now. Yeah, go ahead. Would that Okay, so the question was, what kind of oil would I recommend for like sautéing and heat? Yes, that way that would potentially give the health impact, but not too much of. Okay, it's a good question. So, talking about fats, the best fats for heat are fats that are solid when the when the temperature is 70 degrees. So we're talking butter, saturated fats like palm oil, coconut oil, ghee, and butter. If you're going to cook with heat, those are the best because they handle the heat without breaking, without chemically altering their structure and getting rancid. So if you're cooking food like we all do and sometimes we smoke, the, we smoke the oil and the oil starts burning, you need to turn it off, dump it out and start over because you do not want to eat burnt fat because the, the fats have gotten changed chemically and they're no longer health, they no longer have a health benefit. For flax oil, maybe use it as a salad dressing, um, but really the best oil is probably organic extra virgin olive oil because it's unrefined. Even the organic like canola oil and everything that you see on the shelf, it'll say refined, 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 refined. So what they're doing is they're taking the perfect complete food and they're sucking out the antioxidants and then they're putting a couple back in. It's like just olive oil is the only thing that we really get access to, coconut oil, but olive oil still has all the antioxidants in there. So long answer to your question, yeah, flax oil is probably not best for cooking. Cook with the saturated fats that are good for you. Coconut oil is great, great for you. Yes? So when you eat like two or three hours all day long, can you eat nuts? Sure. Is that good? Yeah, jerky, almond. nuts, avocado, almond. celery with uh, almond butter and raisins. I mean, you know, ants on a log, it's a great snack. Um, you know, we use medical food shakes, like meal replacement shakes in our office. So a couple of times a day, people are drinking those. And, you know, you eat your leftovers. You cook a little extra for dinner, you have it for breakfast. The best thing to eat for breakfast is what you eat for dinner. Chicken and vegetables. Turkey and green beans. The only people who benefit that from, the only people who benefit from like cereal are the people who sell cereal. I saw a PBS special in about, it was based in the United Kingdom. They were talking about raising horses in the 1800s. The only, the only member of the family in 1800s who ate oatmeal were the horses, okay? Oats to feed them, you know? Oats for your horses. Well, yeah, oats, if I was starving and there was a famine, I will eat oats. But if I have access to an egg or a good source of protein, I will eat that instead because that is the much, much more nutritionally sufficient food. We're all sugar addicts. We're programmed to be that way because sugar is hard to find in the environment. So, you know, nothing raises your blood sugar faster than instant mashed potatoes. And I'm telling you the truth, it turns into gl glucose faster than anything else. But uh, instant oatmeal is not far behind. So people eating oatmeal thinking they're doing good by their heart are working on, they're working on ruining their brain. I would rather, heaven forbid, have to choose, but dementia is not a good way to go. It's very slow, very expensive. It's hard on the family. It drains the family estate super expensive. I don't know how we're going to pay for it. There's a lot of people with dementia right now. If we could just get them, you know, do a study, get a thousand people on a clean diet and a thousand people just eat what they regularly eat, you'll see dramatic change if people follow through. So, um, I like this about con consuming liquids. So I used to be the individual who I was really hungry because I was hypoglycemic and I wouldn't eat anything throughout the day. And so by the time I went to dinner, if we happened to go out to eat, I'd be starving. Well, they bring me a big glass of water, and I'm 12 years old. I just drink the whole thing. Please, can I have another? Well, sure. The waitress comes by, fills it back up. Boom. Who here has done that? Okay. What happens if you add water to acid? Does it dilute it or make it stronger? It dilutes it, does it not? So if you have a pH of a good, strong acid, and you pour a bunch of water in it, now that acid is much more diluted. So you just, you just you took your fire, you started a fire with kindling, and then you just pour water all over it, and then you put food down there, and you go, oh, I don't feel so good. I'm not digesting. So don't drink much while you eat. Our ancestors did not kill an animal or eat a fruit 
and walk two miles back to the creek and sit down and eat them and drink together. When they're thirsty, they drink. When they're hungry, they eat. It's crazy simple, but it makes sense, right? So don't drink a lot of liquid with your meals. I would say maybe four ounces, five ounces of you know, what would fill up a wine glass or you know, uh, another beverage of your choice, a tea. You can drink water, but just don't drink a lot when you eat and you'll digest more. Call me crazy. No, it's true. It does work. Don't, don't, don't dilute your acid. It's, again, the stomach acid. You're making your acid even, even lower. Chew food. I don't have the patience to chew 20 times, but it's recommended. <laughs> full, full disclosure, I'm not, I, you know, um, we would probably all benefit from just sort of being, having gratitude while the food's in your mouth and being thankful that we have food and, uh, you know, we're able to nourish ourselves because I think giving thanks and saying grace has more to do with getting into the mind frame of gratitude than anything else. And they've studied different emotions and gratitude is the most powerful positive emotion on earth, you know? It's, I think it's even a notch up above love. So gratitude is huge. So be, gra be grateful for your food. Don't overcook or burn your food. When you grill your food and you see the black stripes on the chicken, I love that look and sometimes we eat that way, but that's not good for us. So if you have a lot of, if you blacken your food, you're eating like carcinogen, cancer causing molecules. So you've burned it so much that your body can't use it as food anymore, it becomes a toxin that you're eating. Some people love to burn their, they love their burnt toast and they love to cook everything till it's crispy. I'm like, you just need to learn how to cook, you know? So don't burn your, don't burn your food. And, and, you know, really the whole point with what I'm talking about tonight is that the, the digestive system rules our universe. And without it, we will never have our full uh, potential as people, okay? So take really, really good care of your gut. And it doesn't, you don't have to have a PhD and you don't have to spend all your time reading PubMed like I do to, to do it. It's simple. The steps we talked about tonight are huge. Eat frequent meals. Avoid foods that irritate your body. If you want ideas on what that is, that's what I can help you do. This is what I do for patients is we, we look at the big picture and figure out what do we need to do, what needs to be removed from their world, what, what is insulting their body, and then that's kind of easy to figure out. The more challenging one is what needs to be added in to make it work better. And that's really what my expertise is, whether that's a physical problem or a chemical. Um, you know, hopefully everybody grabbed one of these this is, this is kind of a, a golden ticket, if you will. It allows you to come in and save a lot of money to come in and see me if you'd like my help in more detail. I spent about an hour and a half with you, uh, just focusing on you and your needs, your history, and what's going on. So you do have that available to you for coming tonight. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention, and I will happily answer any questions, comments about anything I've said so far.